I am Garbo Hearn, Director of Hearn Fine Art. We're located in Little Rock, Arkansas in the historic Dunbar community. And we are so happy that you've chosen to spend part of your Sunday afternoon with us. Today, we are talking about the art of resist resistance through the lens of sculpture. We have four master sculptors with us from, we're in four different time zones. We have Ed Dwight, we have Basil Watson, we have Chooks, and we have Brian Massey, all of which are near and dear to Hearn Fine Art. We have worked with them over the last 33 years of our existence, and we are excited to have them in our presence. Um, we all know that the year 2020 has been a difficult year for many of us, and resistance is not um, anything that's unknown to the Black, to Black culture, and we're using that to start our conversation. And in, in the sense of what Hearn Fine Art's mission is, is to use art to keep the generational wealth going in our community. And we do this through representing and working with Black artists in all different um, styles of their career, whether they're emerging, master artists, or in mid-career. So today, we have all artists in that area. So Chooks, Ed Dwight, Brian Massey, and Basil Watson, welcome. So we're going to start our conversation today with Ed Dwight. So Ed Dwight and I met in 1990. He was working at the National Black Front Arts Festival, and I was just enamored by his work. So I said, man, I really would like to represent you. I walked up to him, and he has always been very kind and generous and said, sure, I'll come to Arkansas. I've never been there. And then that's how it started. And so welcome, Ed, and thank you so much for the many years that we have worked together. So say hello, Ed, and take it away. You got to unmute yourself. Ed, you are muted. You're still muted. Okay, there you go. Hey. Welcome, Ed Dwight. Okay, thanks, Garbo. Uh, uh, you know, I want to congratulate and thanks uh, and thank the other the three artists who, who really have probably, uh, you know, kind of preceded me uh, in the time in, in in doing this. I I started art really 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 late. I didn't start doing art until I was forty five because I had another career. You know, I had, matter of fact, I had two or three or four careers before then, and uh, I I kind of backed into art. Uh, because I had a huge construction company here in Denver, Colorado after I got out of the military. And I was taking junk from my construction company. Uh, I got a, I got a, a welder and started welding art together, uh, pieces of my junk together to decorate my house. <laughs> and somebody saw it and encouraged me to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to move into, uh, into making uh, real art for, on a part of the larger community. And I didn't know what larger community he was talking about because I went to white schools all the way through. And I didn't know who Harry Tubman was until so I was 42 years old. And uh, he told me this story about slavery and he told me this story about all this stuff these black people had done in the, in the 350 years that blacks were on the continent. Uh, and, and he said that uh, we, we, if, you go, if you run around the country, Ed, uh, go to museums, go to galleries, and you'll never find any black images of anybody that's done anything in the black community. And my response was, oh, who the hell cares? Uh, and he, he laced into me and talked to me about racial uh, pride and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, so he went and got 16 books <laughs> and I had my first exposure to, to Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Nat Turner and and the movement and slavery and all this stuff. And I, I'm in my forties and I had never ever heard of these people. Uh, and as a result, he says, you're gonna stop doing what you're doing and make, I had five companies at the time. Uh, you, you're gonna stop doing what you're doing and you're gonna be the, the historian of black progress in the United States of America. And I thought he was crazy until I read all these books about what uh, what, it, what it was to be black. So I was running around pronouncing that I didn't learn that I was black until I was in my forties. So, uh, so anyway, he commissioned me to do a, uh, a, 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 a sculpture series called uh, Black Frontier Spirit in the American West, 
uh, sponsored by the state of Colorado. He also commissioned me to do a sculpture of him for the Capitol because he was our first black lieutenant governor. And I had never sculpted, uh, I, was, I don't do that kind of work. I weld nails together. And he says, go to the library and get you a book and teach yourself how to weld because you're gonna be the master weld, I mean, master sculptor in this country. <laughs> and, I, and I still didn't get it. But after I read those 16 books about uh, our heritage and what we really did, and it's one of these things about uh, thinking that the world started the day you were born, you know, uh, you know, and a lot of us do that. We run around the country thinking that, you know, you you was happening and the world started the day you were born. Uh, and so uh, once I found out that we had a, 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 a history uh, of accomplishment and struggle, I decided to start doing something about it. And uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I took on this project called Black Frontier Spirit in the American West, and I did black cowboys and black race, race uh, 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 black jockeys, everything you could think of, black women in the West, everything you could think of had anything to do with black. And, and it ended up, they hired me to do eight uh, uh, paintings, actually. And so I, I was more into sculpture, so I decided to teach myself how to sculpt. And, and, uh, and I did, instead of doing eight of this, I did about, well, about 55 sculptures. Uh, the Park Service got a, uh, saw it and got a hold of it. And I, and I spent five years with the Park Service traveling the United States of America telling the story. And I developed a slide presentation to go with it about uh, 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 what we did and how we did it. Uh, and it was, it was a, uh, people started buying it naturally. And, um, you know, Garbo saw most of the, of the, uh, of the exhibit. And, uh, I, I was I was showing at all the big museums around the country with that show, and, uh, and if you can show a couple of those uh, the, those early pieces, I don't know whether you, how you show them on the screen, but uh, but uh, it, it had to do with uh, uh, you know this whole slavery piece. I had, had, I was taken aback that there was actually slavery. So uh, this is a, the first slave piece I did. Uh, can you hit the second one? Uh, and and uh, I, I was stationed in the South uh, uh, when I went through pilot training. I was stationed uh, in the South, and, and I was stationed uh, uh, in, in, in the, the, uh, the training facility right in the middle of, uh, of, of a whole bunch of plantations. And, you know, and I, I would go out and watch these guys pick. Uh, I, uh, I took some liberties, and uh, none of these guys uh, were naked at the time from the waist up, but... Uh, I, you know, I had to emphasize that and, uh, you know, because of what I saw uh, down there, you know, with the cotton pickers and of course they had, didn't have hats on, but I mean, that's my artistic license. Uh, 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 next, next slide. Uh, this piece here was generated, uh, you know, when I met, I met Nelson Mandela uh, and they were just getting the voting uh, in, uh, in Africa. And uh, I, I, the uh, uh, Congressional Black Caucus, I was showing at the Smithsonian all the time. So uh, the Congressional Black Caucus got wind of it. And uh, I, was, I was introduced to Nelson Mandela. And so he and I became fast friends. Uh, at, but I did a sculpture of, uh, of not cotton. I did a sculpture of black hands holding uh, ballots. And it just was really huge. And all these ballots were cascading like you see here down in, into a voting a, a, a ballot box. And, and that later stimulated me to do the, uh, uh, you know, hands that pick cotton piece here that hands that pick cotton now, uh, cast ballots, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those were the kind of things that were motivating me uh, to, to, you know, to do this. Uh, the Park Service got me into the, uh, uh, in the, into the memorial business because after, we, 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 the relationship was very, very strong. And so uh, they said they had been looking for a black sculptor and they had five black memorials that they had been holding up, trying to find the right sculptor to do it. And w with the success that we had uh, with, with our being on the road for five years, they just automatically gave me uh, five memorials to do. Uh, there was a lot of controversy associated with it from the Congressional Black Caucus because somebody that thought I was white <laughs> uh, and they wondered why they gave this, uh, all these sculptures, Harry Tubman, Frederick Douglass stuff to this white guy. 
And when they found out I was black, then that because uh, they couldn't believe that I, that I was black, they could do sculptures of of big great people and everything. So, uh, so Frederick Douglass was the first one I did uh, of, of that grouping, and uh, and that uh, from, from that point on, that the memorials spread out, and uh, I did a whole series on black cowboys, and I ended up finding out from uh, from dealing with all these museums that uh, that one of the secrets to success in these things uh, is telling stories. Uh, museums like stories. And, uh, and I did the whole black uh, cowboy thing from start to finish because people don't know that the word cowboy itself uh, was derived from black slaves escaping from the plantation, going west before the, the, uh, before the, the um, uh, the, the black slaves got out there, they were horsemen uh, that, uh, that had all these different names, cow hands, they got every name in the books until the blacks arrived. And they would not give them the honor of calling them horsemen, so they called them boys. And that's where the word cowboy comes from. And, uh, but I ended up learning that in all this research that I had to do because every one of these uh, 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 memorial packages that I did, there was an enormous amount of research and. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, I did a whole study on the first black jockey because the first jockey that won the first Kentucky Derby was black and the jo jockey that won the most Kentucky Derbies was black until, until the uh, jockey started making money and then they threw the black guys out. You go to Kentucky and the blacks are still training the horses to this day. Uh, uh, then the Park Service came to me and said, we did so good on the cowboy thing. Do, I want to, we, they want, asked me to do a a series on the evolution of jazz, uh, starting in Africa. And so, uh, and, and so I did a whole bunch of research on jazz and how it was formed, where it came from, uh, 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 from uh, African improvisational music. Uh, jazz is actually a combination of German structured music and, and, and African improvisational music. Uh, and that's how it's, uh, jazz itself is a German word. That's where the word comes from, but the Germans spelled it J-A-S-S-E. And Sasmo was the one that changed it to J-A-Z-Z, -Z, by the way, he slurred the, the jazz parts and pieces of it. But anyway, this ended up with 70 bronzes where I did a whole study of music instruments in Africa and how they were played. And, the, and I, when they did the museum show, I would compare like a, a trumpet, uh, an American trumpet to an equivalent uh, African. Uh, the, the African vibes, uh, Lionel Hampton who played the vibes. And, and I, would, I would do this comparison uh, with the different music instruments when we did the museum shows. And so, so that was a hit and that showed in all the big museums around the country and stuff. Uh, and then the, the effect of, uh, of the memorials took place after I did the, uh, the, the Frederick Douglass Memorial and it, it just kind of snowballed from there and they just started giving me one, uh, uh, you know, one memorial after another. And it, uh, they started small. I've done seven uh, uh, Underground Railroad memorials and a uh, whole ton of Dr. King memorials. And this is, uh, the reason I use this one here, this is the la latest large one I did. This is about 50 feet long and 27 feet tall. And there's, there's, uh, there's 100 and some figures on it. But the back is, uh, the behind this thing is a whole history of pre- uh, 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 pre-Civil uh, War and all this stuff back in the 1800s when, when, when Blacks were, were, were moving west uh, uh, and of course it was against, the, it was against Mexican law uh, for slavery, for slaves to come into the, uh, in the west uh, and these white families were migrating west and bringing their slaves with them telling uh, these people that the, the slaves were their relatives, they were nieces and nephews but, uh, but, but it was against Mexican law uh, so they had to smuggle slaves into what they call Tejano territory. So that's all on the back. Uh, 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 Sam Houston's two spies are honored on the back of this thing. They were black. Uh, uh, and then I have a whole, uh, uh, I have war battles and all that kind of stuff on the back. And the other aspect of it, I have a political statement on the back. Uh, in both cotton and oil, you will find no blacks as agents to this day, you will not find any blacks in the oil business. And they made sure of that. Uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even let blacks uh, on the, into the oil fields. They did let Mexicans, but they would not let blacks to this day 
uh, into the oil fields and you find me one black executive in the oil business, they don't exist. But the same thing happened in the cotton business as well. There weren't any, weren't any black cotton agents as well. But I have that on this, pa this panel that I'm, I'm talking about here behind there is, uh, is my political statement about to this day. But I start back in 1528, this is a metaphor from 1528, Esteban de Rantes, who was the first black to explore uh, the West, uh, it goes from him uh, all the way over to Bernard Harris, who was the first black to walk in space. And he's from Houston, Texas. So everything that happened between the, the four or 500 year period was Esteban de Rantes over the first black astronaut to walk in space. And this is everything that happened in between. The, they arrested uh, after the emancipation, they arrested every black over 18 years old and put him in jail and put him in these suits. The, the blacks built that first uh, capital there, they burned down and I have, uh, and they built this capital that's sitting here, it was totally built by blacks. Every stone on there, I have pictures of these guys and the stone quarries. There's not one single white face in these images in the research that I did. And the same way with uh, 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 the lumber in East Texas right here, I did people don't identify slaves with lumbering, but the black slaves in East Texas supply all the lumber before the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, they uh, uh, were all run by blacks in East Texas. And so we supply all the wood uh, uh, up and down the East Coast that they built all the buildings there were done by black slaves and managed by black slaves. So I, I did all this research to find out how this stuff worked. And uh, these are blacks here building this uh, memorial here. Uh, they had to stop this uh, general, I can't think of his name now, they had to bring him in to stop this practice of, uh, of arresting all of these black slaves that were, uh, that were slaves, putting them in jail and incarcerating them. Uh, uh, and making them where the, that's where this chain gang thing started. Uh, so anyway, these are the kind of things, and, and this is all the black successes of, of, of Texas. Uh, Barbara Jordan, I got everybody that he is. There was uh, Jack Johnson, Bessie Coleman, all these people were from Texas. Uh, I'm doing a sculpture right now of Herman Sweat who, who uh, sued University of Texas Law School. So I don't know whether my 20 minutes is up, but uh, that gives you the sense of, uh, of, of, of how my uh, you know, career kind of launched. And I, it was partly luck and partly a lot of persistence because I found out that uh, it was about 40% art that I was doing and about 60% research. Uh, to tell that story, uh, to verify the kind of clothes they were wearing, what happened. Uh, and, and so uh, that's why uh, I ended up with all these memorials because of the, more, mostly because of the storytelling. Uh, white folks love stories. <laughs> and if you can hook them <laughs> in the stories where, they, where you have a series and they like things that I, I, I tell other artists that you, you, you need to, put a, spray, a string from one piece of art to the next because they all got to be that way connected. And a lot of young artists, if, uh, like a serious catalog, they go up and start doing all these different things, think they s can satisfy everybody and you can't satisfy everybody. You have to, it's, this is kind of niche stuff. So I'll set my face unless somebody's got a question. All right. Um, so this is Anna Hearn again. Um, I will kick off the questions, but if anyone would like to ask a question, all you'll need to do is unmute yourself or you can definitely put that information in the chat. Um, I will definitely kick it off. Um, so let's just go back a little bit to your biography. You had all of these careers before you became an artist. Um, how do you feel like your careers prior to you becoming an artist inform your work? Um, is it in the technique? Is it in the history? Can you talk a little bit about how your former life informs your current life? Well, uh, the... Uh... All the other stuff I did really gave me, because I ran five businesses uh, and, mo and most artists come into art to do art and they don't come in art to, to, to do business. And, and I've never looked at art as anything other than a business. Uh, you know, I get enthusiastic about some of the stuff that is not 
purposefully related to something. Like if I'm doing an art about history, it's got to be about that. But most artists don't do that. They do art to please themselves. And, and art is a matter of self-expression is really what it is. And, and unfortunately for me, I didn't get into art uh, to do self-expression. I got into art uh, to tell some stories and it just happened to be art was the vehicle that I used to tell these stories. And so I had to become proficient at it and I had to become very, really, really, really very good at it uh, to get people's attention. Uh, uh, so I, I uh, all the things that I had learned, especially in the business uh, part of it, uh, uh, and knowing and having a, a, a physical following of people and becoming a likable person. And that sound, might sound crazy to some people, but uh, uh, there's a good percentage, I would say up to 75% of the people that buy art, they don't buy it because of the art. They buy it because who did it. And, uh, and, and uh, to, uh, the, the, to explain that, it, it depends on how passionate an artist is about what he's doing, but he's got to like people. And there's a lot of, uh, I've met a lot of artists that don't like people very much. Uh, but if you show them you like them and love them and can uh, have an interpersonal relationship with them, I don't mean a, a personal relationship, but I'm talking about a business personal relationship, uh, and, and they end up liking you, they'll find reasons to buy your art. And, uh, and that's, that's been my experience throughout this process is that if you ask anybody about what, uh, uh, about Ed, what I do, he, well, that guy's really a nice guy. <laughs> so, because they, they, they tell me when I travel around the country that I'm not arrogant enough to be an artist. <laughs> and and, I, and I, somebody suggested that I uh, go to go get a master's degree in assholes, <laughs> go to asshole school <laughs> so, I can, so I can be arrogant. <laughs> And, and I'm far from being arrogant and I uh, love everybody and I want everybody to win. And that's the biggest part of all this stuff. Uh, uh, you know, wanting, want, you know, wanting some other people to win and people recognize that. And as a result of that, they, they find other customers for you uh, and all that kind of stuff. So there's more to it. And I found that out in doing, in doing business. Uh, if you become a likable, a likable person at the, at the outset, uh, that that is a key. Uh, if they like your art, uh, and then and then you're a likable person on top of it, that I swear to God, it works. Uh, and that's uh, that's a long-winded answer to your question. You are a very nice person, um, and I know you touched on this briefly. Uh, but can you talk a little bit more about the person, uh, the experiences that introduced you to African American history and culture? Well, uh, uh, George Brown was our first black lieutenant governor of the state of Colorado. And, and I, I swear to God, I, when I was 42 years old, I didn't, I didn't know I was black. I mean, it, it, it may sound crazy, but I went to white schools all the way through. I had a white education. I grew up in the Catholic church and, and I didn't know what black people did. And that sounds crazy. I, went, I left and went into the military when I was 18 years old. I was an officer in the military and my whole world was white. I never saw no black people. Uh, so uh, what I did see some black people working on my airplanes uh, every now and then, but I didn't know what they did. I mean, you know, I see, this sounds totally bizarre, but as I moved along in life, I found out I wasn't the only one. Uh, there's tons of people like that. Uh, uh, that, that blacks that have been madly successful and they attribute it to what they've done. They haven't attributed it to anything anybody else has ever done. Harry Tubman or Frederick Douglass or Dr. King, man, they didn't have nothing to do with me, man. I, I, Dr. King didn't help me get past the bar and they give me all these crazy th th things. So I learned that, uh, 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 that I wasn't the only one. And then when I found out my problem, I try to spread the word. That, hey, man, you, you guys got to come aboard. I mean, there's something going on here. And when I did that, I, I, I you know, I felt even better about, uh, to, about myself. You know, I mean, damn, I'm a part of something important here. This is really cool stuff. And all this other time, I'm trying to be a white man. Uh, you know, and I'm finding, well, hell, I got something to be proud of, too. Uh, and, and if that sounds nuts, uh, it's not. 
uh, it's just one of these phenomena. And, and I ended up, uh, you know, speaking to the history of, 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 of being black and, uh, and being proud of being black and, and telling people the real story about uh, what, what the devil happened, not these painted over stories about what happened. Thank you. And so this is uh, the final question, and I am going to pose this to every artist. Um, the title of this show is The Art of Resistance. Um, can you talk about how your work is grounded in resistance and um, just a little bit reflect on that word and that theme? Well, you know, you, you know the whole idea of, of, uh, of, of what white superiority is and white dominance is, uh, is that uh, for, for in slavery we had to go along with them, you know, and 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 you know, and as finally, I mean, we we had very thoughtful people like the Frederick Douglasses and the Nat Turners and people in Sojourner Truth who had different thoughts about, uh, you know, and so they they begin to just quietly offer resistance, knowing that they were going to be in deep trouble, uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, with this concept of, you know, of resisting the master. Uh, uh, Harriet Tubman carried a gun. She kept it in her waist. She'd go down to, to South and get 27 slaves. And a week out, every male slave in the group wanted to go back. And, and she would take that gun and put it up against her head every night and say, if you think about going back, you're going to put it in your head which meant she had to stay up all night uh, to watch these guys, you know? And so what made her resistant and what made her uh, uh, do the things she did? And not only her, but all the other people that came up with this idea of resistance. And so everything that we're doing uh, in this, all, all the stuff that I've seen is a resistance because in the white community, they were never in a thousand years glorified uh, black folks like like Basil Watson has. I mean, it's they, they, just not going to happen. It's not going to come from them. And so in their world that they live in, him doing black, those large black, larger than life black images, uh, you know, that's resistance. They're saying to you, we got a right and we got, and we got the same thing you got. We've got powerful people. We've got people that can do things. We got sports people that can outrun you guys. We got, we got all of that stuff and we need to, we need to just put that on display. So it puts in their psyches that, you know, uh, man, these people are kind of uppity, but gee, but that looks real. And, and that's what this thing is all about. So no matter how minimal it is, it's the same. It, 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 you know, by just doing black art itself is a resistance. Trust me. Thank you, Ed. But I do have one question. How many memorials have you done in the United States for about black history? Well, uh, it's uh, 130 to at last count. And, uh, and uh, I, got a, uh, I got a big one right now that I'm contemplating doing in France. I, uh, as a great big uh, memorial to, uh, to, 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 to some black soldiers that saved uh, on D-Day. Uh, there was a black unit, totally black uh, medical unit that saved tons and tons of, of soldiers that had been slaughtered and they're doing a, a gigantic memorial to them on the beaches in Normandy. So it's, and I've done stuff in Canada as well, so. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and your participation and you know, you've given us a wealth of history and we appreciate everything that you've done in sharing our history. So our next well, artist- before we, before we move on, we do have someone from the audience who would like to ask a question. Okay, sorry yeah. about that. Introduce yourself, please. I am Adjua Ayatoro. I'm uh, now a resident of Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, and I, uh, I actually got a lot of the art from some of you here on the program, all but Mansi. I have I have to get a piece of your art, Mr. Mansi. I'm sorry, so I can be well represented here. Uh, and I, uh, my question is, uh, uh, Ed Dwight talked about the fact that people bought his art because he was a nice person. I didn't meet him until after I had bought the first piece of your art, and I felt. I maybe the, in that 25% you spoke about, your, your art actually speaks to 
who we are as a people. And that's what drew me to it, uh, to your work. And, to, uh, uh, and I wondered if you uh, had gotten other people to give you that, that feedback that, that it speaks to us as a people. Well, that, that's, that's the main thing that I get from all the emails and all the stuff I get, but that's exactly what you, what you just said. Uh, and, and, and it has to do with uh, uh, my late identification. And it, if it's just not, like I say, it sounds bizarre, it might be a little bit phenomenal, uh, that I, I wanted to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I want to speak to the representation of what black people uh, were, and I wanted to put them in good light, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted the art to respect who black people were, and I, and I have to comment. My first show on the East Coast was on New York Avenue in Silver Springs, Maryland. Okay. <laughs> okay. You also were uh, shown in the St. Louis Arch, which is where I first saw your art. I'm from St. Louis. And uh, a guy who I was dating said, you have to see this man's art. And so it's, we went down into the bottom of the arch. But thank you very much. Uh, I thank all of you all uh, collectively, but thank you very much uh, for your art and for your sustaining my interest in collecting African-American artists. Yeah, yeah. If that, I, I got one comment to make. That, that was the first big uh, show I did for the National Park Service. And I, and I broke the ground by talking to government into letting me sell art out of their museums, <laughs> and they did. So that was a very, very successful show. Well, thanks anyway. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And again, thank you, Ed. Um, our next presenter will be Basil Watson. Would you please unmute yourself? Uh, thank you, Gabo, and thank her fine art for hosting this event and inviting me to be a part of it. And um, I must say it's intimidating going after Ed Dwight. Uh, he is such an icon and uh, a giant among sculptors and artists in, in the United States and the world. Um, we, we as artists, we come from different places and people do art for different reasons and come to it in different ways. I personally came to it uh, or I, I was delivered into art because my father was an artist and I um, grew up surrounded by art all my life. I uh, didn't know if I was going to go into art until I just liked to draw and drawing people. And that is what has really sustained me and my art throughout the years. Um, so I would constantly doodle, draw, draw people. At high school, it was a way of escaping classes where I went to the art room and, and drew. And it was in high school that I eventually decided, hey, I'm going to pursue art. I thought it was painting because my father was a painter, a uh, sculpture in Jamaica. I, I should say that I am Jamaican, uh, grew up in Jamaica, lived there for the first 40, 40 odd years of my life. But um, in high school, I decided that, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue art. I'm going to pursue, probably do painting. So I went to the, the Jamaica School of Art, which my father had actually been the first principal of. So it was an institution that I was very aware of. And um, once I went into art school, I went to my first sculpture class and I, I said, wow, this is, this translates drawing without having to deal with color, having to do with background, but I just love drawing people and then sculpting people. Um, so I pursued sculpture and basically has stuck with being a figurative sculptor since then. Uh, right after school, I, I, um, I went, I opened my studio and started sculpting. And one of the, the important events or achievements um, in my early life was my brother, well, I should say that my father has three children and we all are artists. My, I'm the youngest, but my elder sister is a painter. My brother is also a sculptor. So 
um, in my mid twenties, my brother and I decided to launch the first public sculpture park exhibition in Jamaica. Because at that time, there were a few public sculptures, mostly they were um, co uh, what would be colonial sculptures from the motherland, from then the motherland, Jamaica's motherland, um, which Britain thought itself to be. So they were generally European colonial sculptures in Jamaica, very few uh, public sculptures by Jamaican artists. And from very early, we decided, hey, public sculpture is one of the ways we can get our art to a wider audience, uh, present themes that we think are important and um, create, help to create the environment that we want to see. So in 1988, 87, 88, we, um, we started producing this sculpture park exhibition getting sponsorship from companies and uh, art collectors, art, art patrons to finance this, this exhibition. It was four sculptures, monumental sculptures each, four from me, eight, four from my brother, so eight in total. And um, it took us about two years to do the show. At the end of the day, we paid our bills, um, got nothing from it other than the promotion. But it really opened the door to the to the possibility of public sculpture, and um, in Jamaica. And from then things started to escalate, where we were uh, getting opportunities to to do work. And um, but living in Jamaica is a very different consciousness than living here in in the United States. In in Jamaica, you are a part of a black majority. Um, you have a black consciousness um, as a po uh, or a majority consciousness. Um, you feel part of the society. So I was exploring themes and I've always, this has always been my passion to explore themes that deal with, with life in general. And my approach was uh, life in general. I was drawing and sculpting black images, black people dealing with private and international or philosophical themes. Uh, but it wasn't with the sort of intensity that is now happening here in the United States in terms of a black consciousness and being aware of a, of a, a movement of black art um, staking its claim. But uh, in Jamaica, I, I and did maybe over two to three dozen public sculptures uh, for universities, uh, for private companies, um, and for sporting events, for sporting stadia, like the Sabina Park where we had, I have a cricketer, and the, the National Stadium where it started with one sculpture in um, about 99, not too long before I left, but it has now moved to probably six sculptures in at the National Stadium. But in 2002, um, at the age of 44, I decided that in order to develop on an international level and to, and to get my work to a wider audience, I needed to come to the United States or I needed to come outside of Jamaica and the United States is where I chose. And um, because in Jamaica, you're in an island, it's, it's somewhat insular, uh, you don't get the message out. So coming here in, in 2002, um, it has been a slow but steady climb. And um, I still work, do a lot of work in Jamaica and with my success in both places, um, I have been able to, to work in both places, work in Jamaica and slowly getting work out here in the United States. Um, so, but even now, um, the, the movement of the awareness of public sculpture here in the United States, what it can do for people, what it does um, for societies, how it has been used, um, by the 
status quo here, the white society generally, um, as opposed to putting up black monuments. Um, this is a struggle or, or a movement that is relatively new to me. And um, most of my work, I have really concentrated on private studio work with private work, um, working a lot from models, drawing for drawing sake and sculpting for sculpture sake, as Ed has described, um, you know, we sculpt for different or do art for different reasons. And I've always had, having a father who was an artist, always had this ambition to be, to do art for art's sake and to develop myself as an artist, um, regardless of, of color or culture, which is a great ideal, but you recognize that you live in a gray world where you have powers, external powers that, um, that affect and help and guide your, your movement through the world is not just a straight sail in a vacuum and you have to respond to, to um, the influences that come your way. So you, I am finding that I am taking on a mantle of being a black artist of a certain caliber in a world that don't treat black and white the same uh, and don't tell stories equally of um, black and white or brown or, or more diverse um, statement. And so the, the need that I'm finding is that there are stories that directly affect me, my family, my community that I need to tell. Um, but coming from Jamaica, I have always had this awareness, but it was never as sharp and never as urgent as it is today. You live in a country with Bob Marley who speaks to the world about injustice, speaks for the world um, and for those marginalized people around the world, how he's um, perceived in Africa or United States, around globally. Um, you realize that it has always been a part of, of my psyche, but it is now taking on a, a new dimension in terms of how I approach the work. Um, so I am looking at themes like United Stand that uh, you know, I did in the last year or so as a proposal or a concept that um, we want to look at in terms of how the Black community has had to, to have a United Stand. Uh, this was taken from images from the civil rights era uh, of Martin Luther King. Uh, John Lewis and company. And um, he, here we have uh, Martin Luther King done for the city of Atlanta, which has been a, a breakthrough piece for me in terms of uh, a public work by a major city, the city of Atlanta. And um, speaking to the, the, uh, Black history and the Black civil rights movement, um, hope moving forward, talks about Martin Luther King, uh, his message of peace, his message of moving forward, his message of um, loving one another. Um, and this was recently done. So as I said, it's a, a breakthrough piece in terms of the public recognition even though I have been um, from, time to, uh, from time to time working on pieces of um, black history. This was done in Jamaica in 1986. Um, so from very early, I was looking at the black history. It's called the Three Graces. Um, originally it was called Graceland until I, I heard about um, Elvis Presley's Graceland and then I changed the name. But the whole concept was about the country, the continent of Africa, um, which represents black people being enslaved, being raped, being exploited. So the, the central figure here was eventually done life-size 
Um, the idea was to do all three life size, but it was a work that I sponsored myself and um, it never did come to fruition. But I would say about the, the three graces is that when I did it in 86, it was seen very much, uh, not only was it cut, it was accepted as a concept that needed to be explored. But in terms of being a public work, uh, it was seen as a bit too controversial for the public purview in terms of doing it on a monumental scale. Um, the central figure of, of, of the, the woman in being bound was seen by a company that liked the work but thought it was too controversial at the time and eventually commissioned something else. But I think, uh, uh, this is 30, 40 years later, a work of that nature is becoming more, more important in terms of the message it is talking, um, uh, it delivers in terms of looking at our history and our culture. Um, this awakening, uh, the whole, one of the things that we have to look at in terms of the art of resistance is, is uh, gender issues and um, the awakening of the, the female gender issue of the rights that women have and, uh, and so on. So the, it is not just a color war or racial war, but gender is a, is a big aspect of, of um, breaking new ground and breaking some of the norms that we have all traditionally held. So, um, but it, it, it comes, this is the first public piece that I have done in the United States for the neighborhood health, uh, neighborhood union health center in Atlanta. Uh, it was funded by the city's um, budget that we're, we're building, go, bu there's a building fund that goes into the um, production of art. And this health center, they wanted a figurative sculpture that represented their community because in Vine City in Atlanta, it's one of the poorest uh, communities in Atlanta with probably the worst health record. And here we're, talk we're seeing the um, black female embracing the child, nurturing the child and, and giving support. So this is one of the first um, public pieces that I've done in, in the United States. Um, so the, this is um, Jamaica's first national hero, uh, Nanny of the Maroons. Uh, there is no specific image of Nanny on record. So I was um, given the task of developing a concept of what Nanny would be or what she would express. And um, this was a part of a series of the seven national heroes that, that Jamaica has. Um, here in Jamaica, again, our uh, two recent athletic stars, Usain Bolt and Shelly Ann Fraser, and the impact they have had on a global level, especially the Usain Bolt sculpture uh, entitled to the world. And he really carried it to the world and presented a black um, sport icon who broke records, not just on the track, but in terms of um, the way Jamaicans and black people uh, entertain and declare our, our greatness. So he has become a, a global figure. And these are monuments that um, were, were delivered in Jamaica. Um, but as from the beginning, going back, I always did say that drawing was uh, the, my first contact with art or, and it is still today my first love and forms the foundation for what I do. I, I just enjoy drawing the human figure and it gives, what it does, it gives me an understanding and an empathy with people. So I have learned over the 40, 50 years that I've been drawing, 
that it, it is more than just making marks on paper or trying to depict people um, or trying to depict the figure, but it is really an avenue into researching the attitudes, the emotions and the personalities of and developing an empathy with, with your subject. And this is really what drawing has done and continues to do for me. So when I transfer to doing, say, a public monument, when I have to depict um, a personality, a character, I think that I'm better able to, to understand the personality by observation of their body language, their attitude, how they move, and, and um, small cues from um, how they carry themselves that delivers a message about their personality. So it makes the sculpture uh, more believable. It gives you a more intimate insight into the personality as well as the, the theme or concept that you, you try to display. So basically, um, that is a, a snapshot of what I do and where I'm coming from. And um, so Any from first here, questions? I will... So uh, my first question is, um, can you briefly tell us an overview of your artistic process? Do you use live models? Can you talk about the mediums that you use and how long it takes to go from study to life size? Yeah, well, my my art my process goes always goes back to drawing, so I draw probably at, at least twice a week um, from live models, um, not from photographs, because the most important thing for me with working with models is, is the the interpersonal connection that you make with the model and um, your ability to actually read how they breathe, not just the, the characteristics or, or the, the perfect um, depiction of you know, their anatomy, but in terms of their personality. And I allow the model to bring their personality. So with drawing, I allow them to express themselves. Um, some open, some close, some fold, some stretch. Um, and you, you accept what they bring. So you're always getting new insights into into humanity. Um, from that drawing process, it, 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 I take information and develop the sculptures, I develop sculptures from these sketches. So not just a, a good sketch, but a, a, a pose that I feel expresses something special. And, and I just do, do the sculpture. So it's sculpting for my own satisfaction um, and for my own self-expression. But this also leads to me into thematic work. So when I am looking at expressing a, a specific theme, I have a data bank or, or repertoire of, of things that help me to express and an understanding that will help me to express better this thematic work that I'm doing. So I might have a concept in my head that I want to express, or I might have a commission or a story that I want to tell. So the initial studies help me to, to hit that mark easier. Um, so from drawing, which uh, at this point is mostly charcoal and, or, or pen and ink. And the drawing, I should say, the drawings are usually quick sketches because what I'm looking for is the big uh, picture, the, the body language that expresses, not necessarily the facial features, but, um, but in terms of how the body comes together to express a, a, certain, a, a certain emotion or a certain theme. And then if I'm doing uh, a commission or a specific thematic piece, then, as I say, you know, it helps me to understand how to express certain a, a theme that I have. Um, I most of my work, and because the sketches are quick and gestural, 
looking for that big movement. Um, clay becomes my favorite medium because that in itself has a certain speed about it and a, a flexibility. But it has, but I also explore using stone, I've done metal, um, I've explored abstract, but it always comes back down to expressing the, the human figure and exploring the human figure and the human language and humanity in itself. Thank you. Um, so I would like to touch on the concept of resistance. You uh, talked about this a little bit uh, in your intro, um, but coming from Jamaica and coming to America, um, do you feel like there is a different interpretation of resistance and that theme, you know, being not American, how do you interpret that? Well, I would say, for instance, when I came to the United States um, almost 20 years ago, I had no concept of what dog whistles were. I didn't know um, what the term really referred to in, in a social context. And coming to the United States, your eyes are opened. Uh, in Jamaica, you're living in a, a black majority country with a certain majority consciousness as opposed to here in the United States, we are constantly confronted with the fact that you are a minority and the, the conflict and tensions that, it, that you meet every day um, between the races and, and cultures. So, uh, and, um, so I find that here puts, you feel the tides of, of um, that conflict much stronger. Uh, Jamaica has always been a country that has um, looked on world oppression and tried to deal with a lot of the issues um, on a global level. But within Jamaica itself, there was a certain comfort zone where you didn't feel that you needed to express your blackness. It was taken for granted. There was um, little or no um, complex about being black because your, your black teachers, your, your ministers of religion, your government officials are black. So you find that generally you are in a black majority consciousness and the, the complex is, is not there. So um, it, the Jamaican motto is out of many one and you have a lot more harmony amongst the differences in Jamaica. And um, I guess probably the harmony had to be created while there were vestiges of colonialism and um, a lot of the wealth of the country was still within white hands or these white hands were getting browner with each generation. Uh, you still didn't feel, you, you felt that that minority had to comply with the majority black. Um, we were actually numerically um, in the majority. Here in the United States, you feel that the minority blacks have to learn to comply with the, with the um, white majority. You feel that you have to um, find a way to live with the police. You have to find a way to to convince the banker to give you a loan because you are a black that you know is not considered to be um, delinquent in Jamaica. Banks were lending to blacks. Black opportunities were opening for blacks, um, and I do recognize that it was a change from the colonial or colonial history. Um, we gained independence in '62. And my father would tell me about stories. My parents would tell me stories of the struggles they had to, to um, establish themselves. But as a country, we were reaching there. Um, here, the, the struggle is a lot more, a lot different. Um, a lot of the things that I didn't even know that I was facing, um, you know, in terms of loans, in terms of housing, in terms of mortgages, in terms of, you know, how you're perceived when you walk into a store and um, attendants don't, you know, 
attend to other people. When I came here, I didn't realize that I was facing a lot of that. Um, so now I think within the last four years, four to five years, a lot of these things are coming more to the fore and there's a lot more education about really what we are facing. Um, I know that there are blacks who knew it, but the general public tended to bypass politics. And here in the United States, we still fight to get the black vote out um, because people are, uh, I wasn't aware of what was happening. So it has really affected um, a lot of the concepts that I need, I feel that I need to express. Uh, and um, so it, it comes in, it happens in my work. Thank you, Basil. I met you on the campus of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff with uh, Henry Lindsay. Can you talk about the work that you've done for UAPB? Okay, um, UAPB was the first place that I showed when I came to the United States. I didn't, I had no idea what UAPB represented and um, the opportunities I was getting. The only reason is because there was a Jamaican who I knew um, working at the university who invited me to, to exhibit there. So I, I took the first opportunity I could get and it has been a godsend. Um, it has really been, the UAPB has really been supportive um, it's supportive. It, uh, Henry Linton, the, the chair of the department from the very first, he embraced me and my work and has encouraged me and has helped to put my work in context in terms of what it represents in Jamaica. Um, and I have, so I've had two exhibitions and workshops there. And very importantly, it was Henry Linton who in, introduced me to, to you, Gabo. And um, you were the first commercial gallery that, uh, that hosted an exhibition of my work. Because when I came to Atlanta, I submitted to three, three of what I considered to be the prominent or heard were the prominent galleries and got rejection letters from, from all of them. Um, so UAPB and Arkansas, her and fine art has really been a cornerstone of my of, of my um, artistic life here in, in the United States. Thank you. It's been a pleasure listening to your story and we are going to move on to our next artist and we will have some more questions for you at the end of our presentation. Our next presenter is Brian Massey Sr. And Brian is the chair and professor of art and sculpture at the Department of Art and Design at the University of Central Arkansas. And Brian and I have worked together for probably the last 20 years. And we, we, we see behind him, we see his work on the wall. And it is so exciting to have you here with us today. So Brian, let's take it away. All right, thanks, Garbo. Also, I would like to just uh, kind of an honor to be amongst these, these other artists uh, who are, are really greatly respect their work and, and listen to their story. Um, I, I am a first generation college student uh, out of my family. Um, my other four sisters uh, had an opportunity to go to school and chose not to go to school. And I went to school mainly because my youngest sister, Beverly, um, when she was eight years old, she, uh, we always talked about education uh, and she passed away. And so that was sort of like a motivator for me to, to continue my education. And um, I had a grandmother who always said, you know, no, no son, go to school and make something of yourself. And so when it came time for me to, to choose what I wanted to do, um, I gave it a lot of thought because I, I always knew at some point in my life I was going to be involved in art. I didn't know how or what, what material, uh, what medium I was going to go into, but I knew deep inside myself I was going to be involved in art regardless of what I did throughout my, my life. And so when I decided to, to, to go to school, I wanted to be an illustrator. I wanted to be an illustrator and work for, work for Hallmark. And um, I was on campus at the uh, East Carolina University one summer. Uh, and I heard this commotion going on behind this, this big wall. So I peeked around the corner and I saw this little man, little white man and some students struggling with this huge block of stone. It was sort of teetering 
on the back of this old flatbed truck. And so I said, you guys need some help? And they said, yeah. So I, I took my shoulder underneath the stone and I nudged it back onto the truck, keep from falling off. And the professor at the time was so impressed at how strong it was. He said, you know, we need strong guys in our sculpture area. He said, why don't you take one of my survey classes in the fall? He knew, he knew I was a student there and I knew I had some credit. So I said, okay. And so that fall and fall, I took the uh, this uh, sculpture one survey class and it was stone carving and I was hooked. I, I changed my, my major from commercial art at that time, which is now graphic design, to becoming a full-fledged stone carver. And, and in my research, I didn't see any African-American stone carvers, didn't know of any African-American stone carvers. And so I wanted to get into something that was totally different from everybody else. Um, I did start out figuratively, but I, I quickly went to abstraction because I felt like I had a lot more challenge when it comes to doing things abstractly. Um, of course, I had some resistance from my family. Being a first generation college student, they wanted me to go to school and, and be a teacher. Um, and my father was in law enforcement. He said, you should think about, about criminal justice. And I didn't want to do either of those, those things for my family. So I was sort of um, looked upon as, as, as the crazy one. Brian's going to school to be an artist, so to speak. So um, um, I, I persevered. And I wanted it so bad. I was willing to do anything to be successful at, at what I wanted to do uh, to the point where I, I was I was homeless. I was slipping up 1977 Chevrolet with all my belongings uh, for a while to, to really make it. I wanted to make it as an artist so bad. Um, my journey sort of, sort of changed changed um, past when I, I, after I got married uh, to my wife, Delphine, and I was just sitting at home not doing anything and uh, had graduated. And one of my old professors called me up and said, I'm, I'm making this trip to pick up some works of art. Can you come up and help me out? And I told him, sure. I took some time off and we traveled to uh, several universities in the southern part of the United States. And, and I didn't know at the time he was grooming me about graduate school uh, because he wanted me to go to grad school. And I decided I didn't want to go to grad school. I didn't want to go to anything to do school at all. But uh, he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And uh, uh, on one of those journeys uh, that I, I went to several schools, I ended up visiting um, the uh, Louisiana State University. And, and that's why I ended up in grad school. And I uh, couldn't find out that I was the first African-American graduate student they ever had to, to go to stone carving. And, and did not know until later on that <laughs> I was going to be a first of many things in my career. Um, going forward, I, I graduated from LSU. I, I interviewed at several universities. Now, unlike what they have today, where they got TikTok and, and Facebook and uh, uh, social media, I had do, I did things the old-fashioned way. I, I took every little dime I had. I had 1,500 brochures printed up with my work, some pictures, my resume, and I just typed out envelopes and letters and just sent them all over to whoever will listen, any gallery, any university, and nothing came back. And I began to think, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe I should have uh, rethought what I should have done. But uh, then I got a, I got a bite from a from, uh, university, got an interview. Uh, I came down, to got the interview, flew back to uh, Baton Rouge. And if I landed in Baton Rouge, the university had called my wife and told her to tell me they appreciated my interview and they would be in touch. Uh, about two weeks later, I had a contract in hand to teach here at the University of Arkansas before my ink was dry on my diploma. So that's how I ended up here. And I'm in my 34th year here at the university. Um, and did not know at the time when I interviewed that uh, there was over 300 applications that they had gone through, 300. And they told me when they saw my, my resume and my work, they knew I was the one. I didn't realize I would be the one because I'd be, I was the first African-American hired into the Department of Art in the history of the school. Um, so I'm here and I'm working and, and, and I had a lot of battles and issues with my work uh, because when I look at my work, when I do my work, I try to, I try to pick things that speak to me as an artist. Um, Adam and Eve is, is probably the most important piece that I've done because it's the piece that I, uh, my first international show that I did. You know, in cast iron art, there are not many people of color and cat color in cast iron art. So I was I was one of the eight sculptures that they selected from the region of parts of the United States to participate in this, this fellowship. 
And so Adam and Eve, coming from my biblical background, I want to do something to, to show what I felt like they looked like with these sort of African markings and, and these imagery. And so this is from lost styrofoam, styrofoam casting. And uh, uh, I did this piece in, in, in the UK. I brought it back to the United States and I was going through uh, LaGuardia Airport and I got pulled to the side and they, I didn't know what, what's going on. They had seen my luggage, I had these pieces in my luggage and it looked like two missiles on the X-ray machine. So they thought I was bringing like two bombs into the country. So I've got police and, and secret service and all these people surrounding my, my, my suitcase. They were taking everything out of the suitcase. And I told my wife, I'm glad I did laundry because they would throw my underwear all over the place. Uh, and when they found the two sculptures and I explained to them that I was sculpting, I did these in the UK, they let me pack everything back up and that's how I got past security and customs coming back from that. Uh, show the next piece, Anna. Um, in my travels to, to to West Africa, uh, to Senegal, to the Gambia. I, I was exposed to a culture, like, like Basil was saying, I, I was exposed to a culture that was all black. You know, you land at the airport, the, the, everybody you see is black. Uh, security to, to the people checking your passports. I mean, and I like, I felt I was at home. And I was on one of the tours in, in visiting in Senegal. And when they found out I was a sculpture, they wanted to take me back to that manufacturing plant. I call it a sweatshop. Uh, they said, we're going to take you where no one ever goes because you are sculpted. you like us. And so I was able to go into this plant where they made a lot of the, um, the tourist items, like the, the uh, mask out of wood and canes and things like that. And they and I walked in, I was just amazed when I first walked in at the very beginning of the plant, you had these, these, these little kids running around separating these pieces of wood and as you got further to the camp or to the to the plant, um, the kids got older. By the time I got to the very end of the that's like an assembly line, all the wood carving was done by the elders, the older gentlemen who had the experience. And I'm thinking, wow, they're teaching these kids how to create things from a, a young age. And, and I began to go for that point of how can I create African masks out of steel, out of stone, that will be you know just as beneficial. And uh, this is a, a combination of, of alabaster and limestone. And the challenge is, is trying to carve it from a point where it's not gonna break, where it gets too thin. You know, with African mass and wood, it can go very thin, but with stone, you have to be very particular on how you carve it and, and doing that. Now, go to the next one, Anna. Um, Iron Woman, uh, Helen Reddy was a, uh, had a song, Iron Woman, Hear Me Roar. And I grew up around a community of strong black women from um, my, my grandmother, my aunties, my mom, to the, the women in the community who were single mothers to watch them work. And I just thought about how strong, how, how much strength they had to put up with the ordeal of, of being a black woman in a white man's world. And um, I, I thought about taking materials that I've, I've from the earth, um, Arkansas limestone and bronze, and, cast iron and alabaster and sort of combining these elements together to create uh, this story about I am a woman, hear me roar, and, and use the materials that will reflect the strength of a woman. Um, for me, when it comes to creating, I like telling the whole story. You know, uh, Ed talks about the narrative of stories, and Basil, my tell, Basil says to watch tell the story. As an artist, I wanted to tell the whole story. And what I mean by that is, I wanted to be able to draw my concept, create my maquette and clay, get the materials, carve it together, do the casting, do the wax work, do the mold work, the entire process of doing that. And so I, I, I like telling the whole story from beginning to end. And that's what I try to instill to my students. Be someone that can tell the whole story, not just a part of the story, but the whole story. So I like doing that in, in my work. Right, show the next one now. Card graphite. Uh, I'm always trying something new. Uh, I had a professor who had these blocks of solid graphite, and uh, he gave me a couple. And I didn't know what to do with these things. So I'm thinking, okay, I carved stone, I carved marble, alabaster, limestone. Let's see if granite or graphite can be carved. <laughs> Needs to say that uh, when you carve graphite in your garage, 
all the dust gets into the ventilation system and it goes all over the house. So I spent six months cleaning graphite dust out of my house. And my wife said, never, ever again will you carve graphite at home. You do it at school. But uh, I remember these masks that I saw when I was in, in, in the Gambia. And I did a lot of sketching and a lot of drawing of these masks. And uh, carving these graphite, I wanted to do something different to set them apart. So I thought about shadow boxes and putting them in these shadow boxes and letting their white sort of contrast against the, the darkness of the graphite. And um, a lot of people, when they find it is solid graphite, is the same stuff they use for, the, for powder, for your pencil, things like that. But uh, it's, it's a very hard material, and I really was uh, pleased with the result I got from, uh, from that carving. Other than the graphite powder been all over the house and, and everything. Uh, but uh, yeah, I learned that lesson the hard way. I go to the next one. Uh, when it comes to public works of art, uh, I, I like pure forms of abstraction. And uh, the, the side column you see on the far right was, uh, uh, I was approached by a, uh, a school district in the state of Arkansas that wanted something unique for their, their brand new uh, art center. And their high school happened to be called it the, uh, the Cyclone. And so when I, I did my concept, I always thought that they drawing, I always do maquettes. And I, when I take the maquettes to, to my, my clients, they can see it and take it to the site. Um, then they have a better idea what it's gonna look like. Uh, the tribute to Stradivarius was a, a concept that uh, I don't play a music instrument, but I love to hear a, a violinist play real well. And so this piece is at the, uh, the Grammy Museum that opened up in Cleveland, Mississippi uh, several years ago. Uh, it's a combination of, of steel with uh, bronze cast tuners. And I like using bright colors, uh, red and orange and black to really show, to show my work. Uh, Wind Song is a, a piece that's uh, sitting off the Arkansas River in Fort Smith. Uh, I've always loved the, the sound of chimes. And so I began to incorporate different ideas on how to not just put a chime on a front porch, but how to make it part of an artistic image. And so I, I came up with this, this design, uh, the fabrication of it. And it's, when you hear it plays, it's just, just a beautiful sound. And that's what I combine what someone else did with what I could do in, in my work. And the last one you see is Twin Towers. Um, when uh, everybody knows where they were when the Twin Towers were hit uh, by terrorists. Uh, you can recall the exact time that you were, what you were doing. I mean, I was in, in the classroom and my, uh, my class was interrupted with one of my colleagues. He told me the Twin Towers just got hit. And so I wanted to do something that sort of commemorated that time of what I was doing uh, with that. So that's how I came with the concept of Twin, Twin Towers. Uh, this piece is currently in Scranton, Pennsylvania on the campus of the uh, uh, University of, of, of Woodland here in Scranton. And I think uh, my last piece is Otis. You know, growing up in the 60s, we had limited um, uh, <laughs> television stations. We had ABC, NBC, and CBS. And uh, at 12 o'clock, the, the station would go off the air, not like it is today, 24 7. But one of my favorite shows to watch was The Andy Griffith Show. Um, and I, I was always curious about that show because uh, they had very few black people in the show. But one of my favorite, favorite characters was, was Otis, the town drunk, uh, played by um, Hal Smith. And so when I was asked to do an a angler type bear climbing a wall, I'm thinking, what better name than Otis? Because a bear has to be drunk to climb the side of a wall. They look back up his shoulder thinking, how did the heck did I get up here? And so this is how Otis came to be. And uh, when I was asked to, to do this piece by the committee, uh, they said, we want something that's different. Uh, we want something that's angular, that has uh, angles to it. And, and I said, okay. So I, I actually did an entire maquette of the front of the building that was under construction and uh, did the bear on my maquette. And like I said, I've always do maquettes and models because as, as other artists can tell you, uh, it saves you a lot of time and, and energy when you're trying to figure out composition, uh, scale, placement, how things are going to look. Um, then this piece is called, called Seal. Um, I did this piece for a corporation in Fort Smith and, and they're a trucking company. And they, they deliver by sea, by air, by land. And that's how it came with the name Seal. Um, this piece was uh, it's fabricated in over, over 
over 15 feet tall with a 600 pound limestone sphere. That's only thing that's holding that sphere is just the weight. There's nothing else holding that into those, those prongs. But um, I don't know if Ed or Shoots or Basil have experienced this, but when I went to this site to look at it, uh, as I was approaching, I went up there with the, uh, uh, a friend of mine, he was, he was a white guy, and we drive up. And so as soon as we drive up, uh, we are greeted by two gentlemen. And the gentleman begins to speak directly to the white guy about this sculpture. And uh, I, I looked at the other guy and I told him, uh, I said, he's talking to the wrong guy. I said it loud enough so he, to him to hear me, so he looked back at me, but he kept talking to my friend. And I, I, and I said, he's still talking to the wrong guy. So finally, the guy that was, he was talking to said, well, you need to ask Brian Massey, but he's a sculptor. And the guy's whole countenance just changed because he didn't think that I was the, the main sculptor for this project. And so uh, I don't know if you guys ever experienced that, but uh, more than one occasion where I've gone to a site where I'm looking at a site and I have people come up, they ask questions. If I'm the only black person there and then there's three other white people, they're going to do them first ask them the questions and they say, well, you need to ask Brian because he's a sculptor. And so it's, and that's the kind of things that's, that, that, that bothers me most about uh, uh, being a African-American in a majority white world because um, you talk about resistance. Many times in my work, I, I try not to be a rebel, so to speak, but sometimes I try to do things that's gonna give a message or say something to a person didn't realize that, you know, I, I am here. I am still here. I'm, I'm a person of importance. And yeah, I can, I can do this. I can do this. And so, you know, uh, my journey is, is still in education. I'm the uh, first African-American chair in the department of this, of this school. Um, and, and just to give you a, a fact about how, how rare that is, we have 34 department chairs and directors in this university. And I'm the only African American in, in that position. And so there's something wrong with that picture. And so um, as we go forward, I like for us as artists to not only make our works known by our voices or by what we do, but um, let's look at it as pro probably something that we can use as, as, as a way of saying, you know, we are here. I mean, Every year in February, I get so many invitations in February, but I'm an artist 11 months, the other 11 months out of the year, not just February. But that's one of the things that bothers me most about uh, uh, being in the art world is that, you know, I had to dig and find people like Ed Dwight and, and Richard Hunt and Basil Watson in, in shoots because like you said, we don't have that, that collaborative effort among ourselves to do that. Uh, as, as Ed was saying earlier, uh, we, we know what the white boys are doing. And they know what they're doing, but what are we doing? And so I kind of honored to be amongst this, this group of, of men today. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to touch on um, your role as an educator. Um, do you feel like being a professor and teaching students um, informs your work? It does. Um, Whenever I'm, uh, as, from an education point of view, I, um, I try to instill the students to, to look within themselves and, and to tell the story that they have within themselves. Don't just see me as a, a black artist or a black man, see me as an artist, as an educator. Um, I think it's important when I, I teach students about art is to get a solid foundation, you know, learn the principles, learn the elements of design. Then once you get that foundation, you can pick and choose on what you want to do. And if you have a passion for it, and you're hungry enough for it, you'll keep working. I get asked so many times, what can I do to be successful? Keep making art, good art, bad art. Some things aren't, aren't gonna work out all the time. Uh, the amount of pieces that I broke carving stone uh, in my early career, because I didn't know, led me to keep going, keep pushing, asking questions. I, I took some time off to work with a master stone carver uh, in Georgia. Um, whatever it takes to become, you know, what you want to do, if you've got the passion for it, use education as a path to get there. Uh, your biography says you uh, initially were, were a figurative artist 
Can you talk about uh, your transition and the reason why you uh, mainly do abstract work now and how abstract work figures into the concept of resistance? Well, I, yeah, I started out figuratively. I wanted to do portraits and busts of people. And I got to a point where, you know, I had a professor tell me, he's a Massey, that if you want to be good at doing portraits, do 99, break the first 98, do the 101, and then you'll be good at what you're doing. And I'm thinking, I can't do 99 busts in a semester. But what he was telling me was, keep doing it over and over and over and over again. So I got to a point where I was pretty good at capturing people's imagery. And that's the biggest thing when it comes to doing people, capturing the imagery. And then it got to a point where I didn't see that was, was challenging enough for me as an artist. So I, I, I crossed the line, so to speak, and went to abstraction because I found that doing things abstractly is a lot more challenging for me to, to figure things out, to try to do something that people have not seen before or are not, are not familiar with in doing that. Um, as far as taking the abstraction and, and, and being resistant with it, I did a piece where a couple of years back called um, uh, I Am Still Here. Because a couple of years back when uh, I stood up for the rights of, of people of color on this campus, uh, I, I rocked the boat uh, and uh, uh, ended up getting death threats uh, in the mail. My wife was threatened, my children were threatened. They told me if I wanted to keep them alive to take my blank, 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 whatever, out, out, of the, out, of the, out of the state of Arkansas. And um, under the advice of the FBI, I sent my wife and children to live with her mom, my in-laws, for a while. And I stayed here. I stayed here and I told them, I said, I'm not going to leave the plantation until I get good and ready. Nobody's going to run me off. So I did a piece called, I'm still here, and I did a piece called The Defiant One. Because I people assume me of being quiet, which I am. <laughs> I don't say a lot. But if you push the wrong buttons, you're gonna get something you probably don't want to get. And so, uh, um, when it comes to resist, I did a piece called "I Am Here" and the defiant one to as a message that you're not gonna run me off. You're not gonna cause me to change what I do or what I believe or how I stand up for people of color. Well, thank you, Brian. Tell us about the Sid McMahon uh, sculpture that you did on Barrow Road at that library. Tell us how that came about. But it came about, um, there was a caller artist that went out and uh, it came out to three different artists that were interviewed. And so uh, uh, during my, I was the second person that the family and committee interviewed. And Ed said something that was really important that a lot of people don't realize. We as sculptors do a lot of research when it comes to different types of works of art or, or, or portraits of people. And so I ended up, not only did I, um, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to meet Sidney McMahon. He passed away before I could, but I bought the book that was on the entire book from front cover to back cover. And I learned as much about the man as I possibly could. So when I went to the committee meeting for my interview, I, I knew all his kids' names. I knew he had twins. And I, I, I named them all. And, and uh, they became very impressed that I knew who Papa was. That's what they call They called him Papa. Mm -hmm. um, the last guy I interviewed, they called me back in. They said, Brian, we're going to give you the, uh, the commission. And I said, well, now I want to know why did they choose me? They said, we chose you because you really knew Papa and knew, know what he's really like. And so that's how I got that commission to do that. And it was, that, was, that was one of the sites that I was at where um, we were approached by some people of color. They was talking to the white people about what was going on doing this. And when they found out I was a sculptor, they were like, hey, brother, man, can you give me a job? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'll give you a job. Because um, you assume that these people were the one you had to talk to before you came to talk to me. When you found out that I was a brother, you kind of moved to say brother man stuff. But we went then you went, excuse me, sir. See, the language was different. Mm -hmm. so, but that's how I got the commission because I, I knew, I, I read about him, studied about him, researched his history, knew, knew that he was the uh, um, former governor of the state of Arkansas. And I learned that. It came down between Sid McMahon and uh, uh, what's, what's the governor, Governor Fawless. It came mm -hmm. down Governor Fawless and Sid McMahon would be the next governor of the state of Arkansas. And these white men went back into the back of the room, asked each one a certain question. And evidently, Fawless answered the right question. He became governor of the state of Arkansas. 
Sidney McMath was a man before his time. He was really pushing the civil rights and the rights of people of color. And at that time, 1950s, uh, that was not to be heard of in the state of Arkansas. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your insight and your journey this afternoon. And we will have more questions for you at the end of our program. Our next presenter is Chooks. Hey, Chooks, how are you? Unmute yourself. You're on. You're still muted. There. Okay, there we can go. Can you hear me now? I can Great. hear you now. Great. So Chooks is here with us from Altadena, California. And Chooks, we met in early 2000s when Chooks came to my gallery space and he shared his work with me and I immediately knew that we would work together and we've worked together ever since. We've done many solo shows and everything that Chooks does, he shares with me and I'm so proud to have you here with us today. So thank you and tell us your story. Well, thank you, Garbo, and uh, thank um, the other incredible artists um, for um, coming together and allowing the audience uh, out here to uh, hear each one of our stories. Uh, let, let me tell you, you know, um, it's really affected me to hear such great stories from artists that create uh, in the same mindset. So it's, it's beautiful that you brought us all together and allowed uh, a larger audience to, uh, to hear what we have to say. Um, for me as an artist, I, I would say I didn't, I didn't choose being an artist. Art chose me. Um, uh, I know when I was very young, um, my older brother who was just academically brilliant, um, he would come home and tell me a lot of things that he was learning in school. And I think he was trying to get me to understand what I was gonna be into uh, for when I started school. But honestly, as a, as a very young child, I was terrified of school. Um, I just, it just scared me to death um, because I didn't un understand um, a lot of the things that he was trying to teach me. I just. They just didn't gravitate in my head at the time. So I, I didn't know how I was going to maneuver myself um, around, around my education as a, as a young child. Um, I, but I had something um, happen to me when uh, I was in like the second or third grade, I believe. Uh, our teacher gave us new books and the new book had a picture of a lion and a tiger fighting each other. And I was so enthralled by that picture on the cover of the new book. I just pulled out my binder and I started drawing. it. And so my teacher told me to put my binder away and open up my book. And, you know, we need to start with the lesson. But as soon as she turned her back, I started right back drawing it again. And she must have told me about three or four times. And on the fifth time, she says, that's it. You're suspended. Go home. Now, I'm in the third or fourth grade, and I had no idea what being suspended mean. You know, I just meant she just said, go home. So, um, uh, so I had to leave the class and go home. And so I'm crying as I go home, and I'm like wondering, what am I going to tell my mother when I walk in the door? And I walk in the door, and my mother... You know, I mean, I had three other brothers and my mother said she's called my name because <laughs> she knew it was me. Um, and so she heard me crying and she asked me, she says, well, why are you, why are you home from school at this time? And I said, well, mom, I, I got suspended. Um, and she says, okay, well, what happened? And I said, well, can I show you? And she says, okay. And so I reached into my binder and I pulled out um, the drawing that I made. And my mother looked at the drawing and she looked at me and she told me, she said, son, that's beautiful. And when she said that, it, it just, I, I just, 
it just, it changed my whole life. I mean, it just, I just broke out in tears as a little kid and uh, I'm about to cry now. It's like, um, it just, it changed my life, you know, it just, uh, it, uh, it let me know that there was someone out there that understood. Oh, man. Uh, I'm sorry. It's let me know there's someone out there that understood what I was capable of becoming. And uh, that's my mom. So, um, man, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It's okay, Jukes. I didn't Take think this time. was going to happen. I swear I didn't. I just didn't. Um, Take your time. But, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I just... Oh, man. Um, well, anyways, listen, my mother, she just, she, she's the one that nurtured me. She's the one that understood that what I was going to become. Um, she, uh, she bought all my materials for me, um, as a child, because when, when I started drawing, I actually saw my mother draw because she used to draw our clothes. Um, she used to make our clothes and she would draw them. And I asked her once um, before I even started school, I said, mom, what is this that you're doing? You know, she says, oh, I'm, I'm drawing your clothes I'm gonna make for you. And um, I, I said, wow, mom, you did that? And she says, yeah, you know, and so, I said, can I have a pencil and piece of paper? And um, it changed that changed that changed me too. I mean, it just did because um, I had all these imaginative things as a child in my head. And now that was my when I got the pencil and paper, was my opportunity to get it out of my head and put it on, you know, on paper. Um, so when I would ask for things that my parents couldn't buy me at that particular time, I would just draw it. You know, I would just say, hey, I'm gonna draw this and I'm gonna make it better than what it was that I saw. And as a result of watching my mother draw these, um, pat these clothes, the, the clothes on a, a pattern of clothes, this was my first introduction to sculpture. And I didn't even know what sculpture was at the time, but when she would draw the clothes, she would make them. So then they became tactile and we could wear the clothes. Um, so I was actually seeing the process of, of, of art being created right in front of my very eyes as a, as a young child. And I mean, that just affected me like, it, it just had, you know, it, it let me know that this is, when I started drawing, this let me know that this is why I'm here on this earth. And I understood that as a, as a young child, I understood that I probably didn't even know exactly what being an artist was, but I knew that's what I was going to become. Um, my mother would call, my mother to this day, she calls me Michelangelo. My first name is Michael. That's what she called me. I didn't even know who Michelangelo was, but my mother knew. She understood what I was going to become, and she did everything in her power to give me all of the tools that I needed to become what I am today. My father also did the same thing as well, even though he didn't understand what being an artist was, because he's just a working man. He got up every day and he would go to work and he would make sure that his family was provided for. And um, he never said, hey, son, go get a real job and leave this art stuff alone. Um, he, just, he, he just said, okay, if this is what you're gonna do, um, I'm going to take you to work with me and I'm going to show you how to be, become disciplined. And what he did was he would grab out of all my four brothers, he would take me and he would, I would have to go to work with him uh, on these side jobs. But what I, what I learned from him was his discipline and his attention to detail. And he would always tell me, boy, when you work, don't fool around, don't uh, use the, the best tools you can. Um, uh, make sure you, you take pride in what it is you do. And I mean, we would work all day and I was like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I was just a kid, you know, and I, I mean, I learned so much, you know, just by 
going to work and doing these things with, with my father that I just incorporated a lot of that um, inside of, you know, what I do uh, as an artist today. Um, so, I mean, um, your family is, for me, it was my life support um, as far as the, the entire creative process um, because they're the ones that recognized who I am. And I can never take credit for being what I am now because I understand the uh, importance of having that support system. And especially for a young black artist because so many of us have these great talents and our parents, they have no idea um, how to nurture that. So because of the way society wants you to think and they want you to go out and not use the creative side of your mind, but use the mechanical side of your mind or the intellectual side of your mind or whatever to get a supposed you know, uh, job that you can make a living off of, they veer away from the creative aspect of life. And for me, uh, that didn't happen. Um, that, that, that never happened, I mean, um, throughout my entire artistic career, because um, I just, uh, I was able to uh, have an understanding about this process and how I wanted to affect other people. I grew up with a lot of um, young um, um, Black um, friends that were extremely creative, but uh, they didn't uh, have the support system that I had. So um, I was basically left on my own to figure this out myself. But anyways, I see Anna is uh, showing some images here uh, on the, uh, the screen, and I'll talk about these images. I have created a show titled Identity Theft, and I started on the show in 2016. And this show was as a result of what has been happening to young black males and the police brutality that has been accosted on them um, senselessly, simply because of the color of their skin. So, uh, and my retaliation to their negativity about who we are, I decided to create a body of work, once again, titled Identity Theft. And this is one of the later pieces. And this piece is called Black Power, Black Superman. And it is of a black male with um, these hands, which you see the white hands. And these white hands are holding up this black male because they understand the power of who we really are but they also try to deny us the power of who we truly are. Truly are. So I decided to exag exaggerate the power of who we truly are. But in my exaggeration, I put the fist, the black power fist, and I put it right where his growing is to let you know that there is nothing on this planet that you are gonna do to stop and deny us the greatness of who we truly are. And so this is exactly what this piece is representing, how powerful the black male is, but also how intimidating we are and how much you have tried throughout history to deny us of our true greatness. And so when you look at the back of this uh, particular piece, you see, uh, when I say black power, su black Superman, you see the imagery of the suffrage that we've had to uh, had from the hands of our oppressors. But still in all, we have still maintained our power and no race in the history of this world has ever gone through what we as a black race have gone through, but we still continue to have love and peace for humanity in, in our hearts. And no other race can say that about themselves. We should be the most angry, um, uh, outrageously crazy race on this planet, but we're not. I know in my heart, I know what's happened to us, but I know for me, I have love in my heart, even for my oppressors, 
because I will not let them win with their negativity because that just brings me down to their level. So on this next piece right here, um, it's titled My Big Black Beautiful Lips. So many women in this day now and age now are becoming ashamed of their black features, of their blackness, of their true beauty, of the color of their skin. You have these beautiful black women and women of color bleaching their skin, trying to deny themselves of who they are because the white woman is supposed to be seen as the most beautiful, precious prize on the face of the earth. And for me, that's just not true. For me, the blackness of my skin is the most beautiful blackness I've ever seen. The blackness of my wife's skin is the most beautiful blackness I've ever seen. And she wears it with pride and, 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 and glory. And I'm so proud to have that influence that I have from the female um, be a part of this work. So for me, saying my big black beautiful lips, even though the piece is white, you can see it is of a black woman, but I'm exposing the beauty of this woman's black lips. Because for me, it, it, situ it accentuates the, the, the magnitude of what this piece represents and how beautiful it, it truly is. So what I'm saying to these young black women is stop letting society tell you that the color of your skin, the size of your lips are, is something that's negative. That's the most beautiful feature you, you, you have. Wear it with pride, understand your beauty. Stop uh, buying into all this negativity about who, you know, what this other, what uh, other people tell you the imagery of beauty is about because it's not, that's not what it's about. Your beauty comes within you. Your beauty comes with understanding who you are, accepting who you are, and, and go out there and flaunt it. Don't hide from it. Understand it. And then when you see someone else that, that may have a, you know, inferiority about who they are, go and talk to them and tell them, no, sister, you are beautiful. Love yourself. Express yourself. Don't hide from it. Don't let society tell you what they think beauty is all about because they're wrong, completely wrong. Okay, this piece right here, uh, I have had um, a great many people write me letters. I just had one person write me a letter about a woman's uh, health group um, who has done all these childbirth birthings and uh, all and she wrote me a long, long letter about uh, how, you know, thank me, thanking me for celebrating the, 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 the understanding of women holding up uh, children and, you know, on and on. She went on and on. And then at the end of the letter, she asked me to give her the peace. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So anyways, in rebuttal to her asking me to give her the peace, uh, I have uh, an assistant who uh, wrote her back. I have a great assistant. And my assistant sent me what she wrote. And she says, could you, how do you want me to respond to this? And I said, well, you just go and respond to it the way you, you think you need to. And so when she responded to it, she said, thank you for, you know, uh, your appreciation of the work. But in essence, this is not a woman holding a child this is a male and this is something that our society especially as black males has never given us credit for loving our black children we always see the woman we always see the female figure holding up the child being the motherless without the black male being a part of the child and so when i say protector of the next generation I'm a black father. I'm a black single father. I had to raise my daughter. And this is not a representation of me, but it is a representation of me because this is how I felt about raising my child. And I said to myself, when I hold my child, there is nothing on this planet that is going to rip my child from off of my arms. And so you see the definition and the veins in these arms and these hands. And these hands look like if you mess with this child, I'm going to break your neck. And so, but if you look at the child, the child, it looks safe. 
secure and is loved and nourished by the male, by the man, something once again our society has told us that black males are not capable of doing. Well, that is a lie because we are capable and we do love our children. We will not let society tell us that as a male that we, we have walked away from our, that next generation. We understand the importance of our next generation and we don't need the media to tell us because all they're gonna do is show us in a most negative way. And so we as males, we need to stand up and understand the greatness that we've given to this society and show that we love our children. This next piece right here is my protest piece um, as a result of what happened to uh, George Floyd. Now, this isn't a self-portrait of George Floyd. Um, I don't do self-portraits. Unlike a lot of the other uh, artists that are on this panel, I make no drawings. Um, I don't use models or anything like that. This is just what I see in my head. Um, it works best for me to do that. And so what I'm trying to do is just get the expression of these particular pieces um, that give a power about themselves, that have their own aura. Um, they may be, you know, faceless to, to me, but there's always someone else out there. I've had a lot of people say, how did you get this image of me? Because they think it's them. But anyways, this piece right here is just saying, I'll be goddamn if you put your hands on me, you know, try and stop me from breathing. Come up here and try and put your knee on my neck because not only will I get you all the power of all the black fists and all the black men and black women of America and all parts of the world are gonna come after you, just like they came after this sick, demented person that decided to take the life of another black man. And now he's going to prison for it. Um, so in my protest, I'm just taking it to you straight. You know, this has got to stop. And for me as an artist, these are my protest pieces. And, 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 and this is actually my nonviolent protest as to how I deal with um, travesties that happen to us here in America. Because I think as an artist, we have to, uh, for me, I have to express how I feel in my creative process. I love to just create other visions that are in my head. But when something horrific as this happens, I have to have to come back. I have to speak out about it. That was this piece, that's what this piece is about. Um, this piece right here is another piece that didn't have to deal with um, any negativities or travesties in the world. This is just me freely thinking. And it's uh, entitled Embryo. Um, it's just uh, another image of how connected we are to, to, to the womb. Um, the greatness of females, as far as being uh, an artist or a sculptor, nothing a male could ever do on this planet could ever create uh, or equate to what females are capable of doing because they are the ones that give us birth. They are the ones that create us, that make us who we are. Yes, we need our little male sperm or whatever, but we don't birth these women for nine months. They don't sit in our womb. I mean, they sit in the female womb. You know, I mean, the mother, she nurtures and cradles us. You know, so in the womb, this is what this piece represents. And these are three women. These are each different sides of the woman and they're all connected together. They're all connected together. I mean, they are, that's just how tight and, and how bonded they are uh, together. I mean, because when I see love between women, which is shared so much more freely than the love between males, um, there's a connection that uh, I wanted to express in all three of these pieces. So I entitled it Embryo because it starts from the womb and it just continues on through life. And then women regenerate and they have children again. And so the process goes all over again. This is uh, another piece, it's called Nature's Three Mothers. And these are three different sides of the different pieces. And the pieces are just like, they're like life, um, the, the middle aspect of life, which is the purple um, piece. And then the green piece is the regeneration of life uh, starting over again. Um, so I just wanted, once again, I'm always influenced by the female aspect and I wanna always incorporate that in, into art just because of um, the way I feel women have affected me. Um, 
in, in my life. So I'm always celebrating that aspect of that love and effect I've had um, from, the, from the woman. Thank you. Um, I know plenty of our audience members have some questions and I know that we want to get to the round table. Um, so would you like to go into the round table so we can start that organic conversation? Uh, that's fine, whatever, whatever you wanna do, Anna. All right, so I am going to invite Mr. Watson, Mr. Dwight to unmute. Um, and I did send you some questions in the chat that um, our, our, our audience members have for all the artists. Um, I can definitely resend them again if you need me to, or I can just pose them if you'd like to get it started. Uh, however you want to do it, Anna. I mean, you can just right. pose the questions and we'll just go from there. Well, I really love the question uh, from... I believe it's Ms. Sharanga. Uh, she talked about uh, the very act of being an artist. Um, do you feel like there is resistance in you all choosing that profession? And Brian and Edward, please make sure you unmute. Feel free to take it away. Well, I'll, I'll talk about resistance. Um, um, I think I've always had a rebellious aspect of who I am simply because um, I think it's because of the color of my skin. And I can't pinpoint it any other way. I mean, throughout my entire education as an artist, um, uh, I've always felt like I've been I was intimidating people um, through school where I had, I did have a great high school art instructor and he's the one that accelerated me to move my art career even further. Um, and I give him credit. I mean, I actually named my kiln after Mr. Shannon. I mean, that's how much of an effect he had. I mean, and outside of my mother, I think he's the greatest art teacher I ever had. But I mean, going to school um, for me, I mean, when I started college, uh, I didn't go to school to study art. I mean, that was my major. I went to school as a, as, a, as a track and field athlete. I mean, I got my first scholarship, a full scholarship um, um, from San Jose City College being, um, you know, one of the fastest uh, hurdlers in the nation. And I got a full scholarship to San Jose State. Um, but when I was in school, I was like an anomaly because they didn't know what to do with me. And when I would show up to class, especially, um, my art ceramic classes uh, or sculpture classes, my instructors would look at me like, what are you doing here? You know, you're, you're an athlete and you're one of the top athletes. And this was an A and you don't even really have to be here, you know, cause we're gonna give you an A anyways. Cause that's just the, that's how, you know, I would say corrupt, you know, schools were back in those days. Um, but I went to school cause I, I had a, wanted a place to work, but they would kind of just leave me alone, you know? so. I, would, I just continue to work on my own and, and, and continue to create on my own. But I, it bothered me even up till graduate school because, you know, when I say that I'm a self-taught art, artist, they say, well, how could you be a self-taught artist when you have a master's degree from Claremont Graduate University? Well, my art instructors would tell me that, you know, uh, we can't teach you anything. Well, then I tell them, okay, well, I didn't go to school for you to teach me anything. The reason I came to school is so I could learn to read and write and understand and be coherent enough to sit down and write books about uh, my art and, and uh, teach about what it is to be an artist. Um, and that's what I went to school for. It had nothing to do with them teaching me how to create what I create. It had to do with them teaching me how to read how to write about my work and understand it and then give the work that information to other people. I, I want to talk about the power of mentors um, and the effect that we, the four of us sitting here and artists today in, in, in the community have and the responsibility they have. 
Growing up as a son of an artist, I really give thanks to my father who was discouraged from doing art. Uh, they thought that artists would live a poor life. They couldn't make a career. Um, my grandfather wanted him to become a, a lawyer. Um, he refused to help him through college. Uh, he went to England to study and the, the struggles as a black man in England in the 50s. Um, he was actually the first black person, black man to go to the Royal College um, of Art in London. I don't know, I cannot conceive of the strength and the conviction that he had to conceive of the idea of becoming an artist and to, to follow it through uh, but he always gave the, the, he was always determined to present himself as an educated person, as somebody having a, a credible career um, and being somebody worthy of respect. Um, you know, so he had great struggles to, in, in the 50s, 60s, he, he um, emphasized certain things. He wore uh, suits to work to show that, hey, as an artist, I am a professional uh, and worthy of it. Today, we probably don't need a suit. And uh, today, I don't need a suit. I can wear shorts and flip flops. And, um, you know, because he wore suits back then. Um, and as an example, as a mentor, he gave me the, the, the vision to recognize that uh, and the example that I can be an artist, I can succeed. This is how you succeed. This is how you, you have to view yourself as an artist. So it gave me the, the confidence and, and self-esteem to know that, hey, I can be an artist. I can do what I wanna do. I can deal with self-expression. But I see a lot of my peers not having this, uh, this example in their life, uh, struggling with the decisions of how do I uh, turn this creative spirit into a career. And um, not everybody overcomes that battle and, and, and many people, you know, fall prey to it and, and decide that they're going to try and do something else and then do art. And what happens is that they never get to it. Um, so I feel fortunate. I don't know what would have happened if he weren't an artist, but I feel fortunate and um, try to make the best of the fact, of the examples that, uh, and the, the advice and, and, and the vision that he was able to pass on. And it, it gives me a sense of responsibility to encourage and try to inspire. You know, if it's only one, then that's, you know, um, work well done, but you know, the power of a mentor is, is important and you have to accept that responsibility as you, as we, you know, as we develop in our career. I guess for, for me, um, the resistance was coming from, I always being told I couldn't do it. Um, the number of living, in a, a racist county where the Grand Wizard, the KKK, was the head of the county I lived in, um, I was always told by a lot of my white teachers I, I couldn't be an artist. I didn't have the talent. I didn't have the skill set. I didn't have the knowledge. It is. So my, my resistance was to, to prove them wrong um, and, tell, and show them that uh, I, I could do it. And when they counted me out, I, sh I wanted to show them I could do it. And, you know, for me, racism is, has been my biggest motivator to show people, uh, you know, that my art can make a difference in people's lives. And it has a story to tell. And I, and I, can, I can tell that story. Um, it was difficult for me because I didn't, I didn't have that mentorship like, like some of my colleagues had in, and, and I felt like I was out there on my own a lot of times. Um, but then when I found out that I had people like Ed Dwight and Basil and Chutes and 
Richard Hunt, who was, who was carrying on the torch. I wanted to be a part of that. But my resistance come from improving my white teachers that discouraged me that I could do it. Yeah, yeah can I make a, a, a couple comments here? Uh, uh, Brian, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Join the crowd, buddy. You, you, you were uh, uh, telling us about how people were quite surprised that you, know, you were the sculptor of all these wonderful things that you do. And, and that's been the story of my life for 40 years. Uh, even people have heard of me, but uh, I'm only five foot four inches tall, okay? <laughs> and so. Uh, you know, you know, I come to these unveilings and stuff, you know, and uh, uh, and I get this from black folks as well as white folks, man. Uh, you cannot do this because you're too small and you do this and you do that. And, and, and then on, on the other side of it, or, you know, there are people, especially white people, have heard of me and uh, and, and they do you know, give me this all that kind of stuff. But uh, I'd like to, uh, to uh, from, for if I could take a couple minutes about, uh, you know, the responsibility. And if, if any, any mothers watching this, you know, the what I what I would call, the, you know, the responsibility of black mother, of black motherhood. Uh, from the time I was born, uh, and as long as I can remember, of uh, course my. my my father was from the deep south and my mom was from Iowa. She was college educated. And my dad would come home railing against white people. He just hated white people. Uh, and I don't know whether that's what started it, but from the time I can remember uh, until, I 18 year, until I was 18 years old and left home, every day my mother would come into my, my, my little alcove in my little room every night and the last words I heard from her was, you know, don't, uh, uh, you know, don't take all that stuff to heart about hating anybody. And she launched into this thing about how, how incredible I was. Now I'm this little bitty guy that's still in the bed, and she's telling me that I'm God's gift to everything. And uh, you know, after a, a, a few years of that, you, you know, you come to believe it. <laughs> Uh, she started me in school when I was two years old, and I had this proclivity for making art uh, at, at two. And so I became the, the class artist in, the uh, in the preschool and kindergarten, uh, the school artist in school, and also the school artist in high school. I was in charge of all the art that was done, and, and I, as a matter of fact, I had an art scholarship out of uh, high school because I had won the uh, uh, three Kansas State contest for uh, art contests in the state of Kansas. Uh, and of course, uh, the state of Kansas only had one black high school uh, in, in that I didn't go to that black high school. I went to, I integrated a white high school back in 1947. Uh, and, uh, and, and so anyway, I, I had won a scholarship to the Kansas City Art Institute. And my father got a hold of me and asked me, Oh, oh, I opened up a sign shop when I was 14. And I had all the black churches, the pool halls, all the black restaurants, and I did all their signings and all their graphic work when I was 14, bought my first car at 14 with my art income. Uh, so uh, and my old man built a, 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 a studio in the back of the house. And then when he asked me what I was gonna do uh, it, with my life, I said, I'm gonna naturally, I'm gonna be an artist. And he said, no, you're not. And he said, you find me somebody that's making art, black or white, uh, uh, and then I'll back you in this adventure. And I couldn't find anybody in, anywhere that knew anything about art or art making money or anything of the sort. Uh, so he, I asked him what I, what I should do. And he says, uh, you're going to engineering school, period. And I asked him, I said, well, I didn't have no idea what engineers did. <laughs> so I, I said, what the hell do they do? And he told me they make money. That's all you need to know. Uh, so anyway, I uh, I was born near an airport, and I got into flying, and I went into the Air Force and became a pilot and all that kind of stuff, and got two engineering degrees out of that. Uh, and I've and I ended up working back into 
but my, uh, the message here is that, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of people like that, and especially black mothers. One of the things, the, the effect of my mother into my room every night and telling me that there was nothing in the world that I couldn't do, nothing. And it was going to take whatever I chose, it's going to take work, but there's nothing you can't do. Uh, and I heard that uh, for, for 18 years. And when I walked out of that house, never, uh, never to return, uh, I, I walked out of there with this attitude that there was not one thing that anybody could present to me that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't figure out. Or, uh, so, so that resulted in, in my being successful, and that's why the president of the United States chose me as his astronaut guy because I had all, all these. Wow. So you know, getting into the art universe. Uh, was really going back home, but but but, it, but this begs to, the, to, the, to all of us what we're talking about here is this confidence that we've got to bring to the table, and mothers are the key to this confidence. And we can go all get all the mentors in the universe, but if, if we could get the message to our young black mothers that they've got to tell those kids that they love them, that's where it's. <laughs> It starts with the, with the mother telling, because we, we have kids that have grown up, never heard that word, I love you. Uh, and, and if you're loved, uh, then you can do anything. Because uh, once you accept that love the mom gives you, you're responsible to her. And like, I mean, no <laughs> consciously, you are paying, you, you are responding to her giving you the responsibility of accepting love. And so I, I I talk about that a lot, and I and, and we we've got a job to do, and fathers can get involved in this as well as telling their kids that they love them, because all the things that are happening to our kids is because they're running around seeking love for where they can get it, and sometimes it's not so good. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, that's kind of my contribution to, to this whole process. Of, uh, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll be 88 years old in a minute. So I, there's a few things that I've kind of learned, learned out of all this stuff that have done uh, by, uh, by actuality rather than, uh, uh, you, know, all, you know, all the rest of what I, I think, I think this, I think that, I think this, I think that. It's, uh, it's, it's what's really happened to me and to life. Uh, and, and that's what's wrong with this country right now because you, you have all these white people running around here uh, and they talk about love uh, and all that, all that jazz. And they had to have no idea what the hell love means. Uh, and, and they're so easily, their heads are so easily turned away from that uh, and justified it. And they, they have this idea that love means having somebody to hate. Uh, you know, uh, loving themselves means somebody, that they have to have somebody to hate in order to do that. And, and that's not the way love works. It, it works in a different way. Uh, it, uh, real love works in a different way. So we've got a job to do, guys, and uh, and the job is caring about each other in a big way. And so when opportunities come, we need to share those opportunities. Because I got to tell you something. When I came into this art world, the established art community sold me down the river. They did everything possible to undermine everything I did. Every memorial I got, they would call the commissioners that morning and, and tell them that I, I was a phony, I was a crook, I didn't do art, that I had a white person doing the art for me. And so as a result, uh, uh, you know, uh, they shouldn't give me a commission. And this went on, they wouldn't have exhibits with me. Uh, they just absolutely wouldn't speak to me. I went to them asking for advice and counsel. They wouldn't even talk to me. Because uh, I threatened them in some kind of way, and I don't know, uh, you know, it was just one of these things. Uh, it's like the crumb theory, you know, everybody's fighting over the crumbs that are thrown out. Uh, and, and we've got to do a good, better job of making crumbs for ourselves. So every one of those things that you do, uh, like Brian, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 put it on Facebook. You got to let people know that you're doing things. Because you, you, uh, otherwise you operate in a, in a vacuum. You got to let people know either if you know somebody that can do some PR for you, every single thing you do, get it out there. 
and the galleries can help, of course. Get it on Facebook, get it on Instagram. Let people know that you're around. I'm a consultant for large scale memorials. I got a $2.4 million memorial uh, in, 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 you know, in, in, in Oklahoma City. And, and you know, there's a guy in the, in the group that knows all about this uh, memorial. But I mean, but the issue is trying to find people to, to do these memorials. We got the Mellon Foundation ha has put up $250 million for black sculptures and black memorials to replace the memorials that are being torn down, the Confederate memorials being torn down. $250 million. That can make a lot of memorials, okay? The white boys are, 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 are going crazy trying to get that money, okay? Uh, and there are a lot of them that, that uh, and I've, I've been fighting with these guys for years because I mean, the, the architects of these big memorial things come in and, and sometimes they bring their own white sculpture. To it. And these are black memorials I'm talking about, okay? So, so, so we've got to share these things and we've got to talk and we've got to find a way, no matter what genre you're working in, we've got to find a way to, 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 to get, uh, get you, you know, contributed you know, to these memorials. There's a $25 million memorial going up in Charleston right now. There's not a single black artist associated with it. A black museum going up in Charleston with no black sculptors or, 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 or blacks involved in it in any way. The head of the thing is a black guy, for, you know, but, that, but that's it, okay? But those are the kind of things that are going on right before our very eyes, and we've got to uh, uh, spread this stuff around and bring people in and find ways to get, you know, some facility, some things that you're doing that, that we can get involved in spending this $250 million. Uh, so anyway, I'll set my face, and uh, anybody else got any comments or questions, I'll answer uh, I, listen, I want to thank you for, for uh, informing uh, us, if we didn't already know, and um, the audience, uh, to your knowledge, um, Ed, because these are, you know, I mean, I've never heard of anything like this. I mean, I, I, I don't really work uh, on commissions. I've done a few of them. Um, I'm just basically in my own kind of world, uh, but I do... Uh, have a lot of my work on social media. It's been great for me uh, simply because of the pandemic. And I think it's a tool that is not uh, going away at any time. Uh, it's very important because uh, for us to have a voice out there. And I think for, for me, social media has given me a larger voice. And uh, I hate to say that than the galleries or any other venues that I've sold in simply because now I have access throughout the world. Um, my, actually, my show, um, Identity Theft, was on its way to, to London, and it was supposed to be there at the end of this year. But because of the pandemic, um, we had to stall it out. And I'm going to have to wait till 2003 to bring 50 of my sculptures to London to show my exhibit um, uh, of identity theft there. But that only happened as a result of sharing my work uh, through social media. So, I mean, there is no reason now for us to complain um, about what we are not given because of the power of social media right now. So I would say for all of us as artists and to our audience to, if you can't find us in, in galleries or any other venue, look for us on social media. So I'd like to ask that question to all the other artists. I mean, We've heard what what you know how you know um, social media is 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 has helped um, help you Ed, but how how has it helped um, you know uh, Brian? How's it helped you, uh, Basil? I mean, how's how has other venues as far as getting your art and your message out there? How's that helped you? Well, well for me, uh, social media is. I have to give credit to my daughters because uh, at one point in time, I didn't think that social media would be a uh, an effective tool, uh, and they went ahead and set me up a, my account up behind my back and began to show me how to use things and get my story out there. Um, very seldom now do I really compete for commissions. I'm usually sought after or sought out, out because of social media, 
Uh, so for me, it's been a, it's been a great tool because um, three commissions I'm working on now are as a result of what they saw on my Facebook page. But I, I want to say that in, in Jamaica, it's an island. And um, living in an island, you're really in an island. Um, you might see a book in the bookstore or you go to somebody's house and you might see a book. But getting information about artists, what's going on in the wider world was non-existent when I was growing up as a young artist. You have the traditional art books that you get, but what's going on contemporary in the contemporary art world was non-existent. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come to the United States to connect more. Um, but recently, social media in the last 15, 20 years, social media has exploded a lot of that insular situation that we have found. And I'm, I find I'm connecting with artists all over the world. Things that I was wondering if I was the only one doing, I'm now seeing people doing and appreciating from various different cultures, not just the culture that I'm growing up in or the state, what is considered the status quo or the world culture, where you find people in France, Japan, Australia, Africa, all with a similar view and, and you find a community. Um, the social media has become one of my biggest teachers in terms of technique and learning um, and improving my art. And um, one of the questions I would love to, to ask you guys, growing up in the United States, um, did you see or experience or were you able to find many black uh, mentors or icons or people that could inspire you to feel that you could do art? Um, that's a question I'd like to throw to you, to you guys. Well, let me jump in. Let me jump into that real quick. Um, for me, uh, I mean, outside of my, the emotion I had earlier today about my mother, I, I apologize for that. It just happened. But that's how close, you know, that's how much it meant to me. But um, I did have some, wh whenever I did have someone that I could relate to, another Black person help me with my art, it, it was always, I, I was just, I gravitated to them. It's like you had to rip me away from that person um, because it was such a rarity uh, growing up in Northern California um, because I mean, I just didn't have that. I mean, it's like the, the avenues for all of the white artists, I mean, they were abundant, but for black artists, it was very rare. So when you met another black artist, I mean, you, you, I mean, we remain friends to this very day until, you know, unless they passed away or something like that. I mean, I stayed in touch with all of them. They've had an incredible effect on me, but the, the effect it had on me was not so much the knowing that there were other black artists out there, but what it, it, it did for me was allow me to go out and search for other young artists that didn't have a type of mentorship. I wanted to have a voice that I, would, that I could go out and help other young black artists say, hey, you're very talented. So, you know, let's sit down and talk and let me show you some of the things that I've done as an artist to help you along your, your journey. And that has been one of the most rewarding things that I've had uh, with, with, uh, with my skills as an artist. And I'll tell you a quick story. I had a young man um, from South Africa. Uh, uh, a friend of mine called me up and he says, hey, there's a young man who's visiting from South Africa. He's studying to be uh, uh, an artist. He's, um, and they've sent him out here to school and he works in clay. He says, could you spend some time with him? And I said, of course. And so the young man came over and he was in his very, he was in his 20s. And he says, uh, um, I said, well, what do you want to do, Aaron? He says, well, I want to, I want to create a sculpture. And I said, well, okay. He says, well, I'm only going to be here for two days. I said, well, it's okay. He says, well, in my school, they won't allow me to create and get loosey, loose. Um, they said, they let all the white students do what they want to do. But for the black students, it was structured. You'd have to listen to what they had to say. I said, don't worry about that, man. In two days, I'm going to show you something that you, you'll never get in your South African schools. So he says, well, what's, 
what takes you two days takes him, you know, maybe two weeks. And so for those two days, that young man came over my house first thing in the morning and we worked until 11 o'clock at night straight. And in those two days, he created the most incredible sculpture. I mean, I just seen the look on his face when I showed him my technique on as far as how to deal with clay. And to this day, this brother now has gone on from uh, and uh, from uh, undergrad to graduate school, and now he's a doctor, you know, and he's moved back to South Africa. And every time he does that, he shows me, calls me his older brother, Brother Chooks, and he sends me images of new work that he's doing. And so that's the power of mentorship. And I think it's something as all artists, we can't be selfish and keep all this to ourselves. We have to pass it down to the next generation. So I, I know that all of you brothers are doing the same thing, but that's just my model as an artist because it's not me. This gift was not, it's not, it's a gift. A gift is something that is given to you and that you have to give back. Uh, otherwise it's not a gift. And so when I'm gone, it has to go on to someone else. So that's, that's just my responsibility as to what I'm, what I'm trying to do with my, with my creative abilities. Oh, okay. Pass it on to the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to say something here. You know, uh, we, we've, uh, we're, we're all together right now for one reason. <laughs> and that's Garbo. And so we've, we've talked all about the methodologies of getting from one uh, uh, stage of this thing to another. But we, uh, Barbara brought us together and there's a place for galleries in this thing. Uh, we do not have a good sound of effective network of galleries in the United States of America, okay? And Garbo has been uh, uh, plowing the fields and been down there for all these years and, and doing her thing. And uh, she's one of the few that are still standing versus many, many others. The pandemic killed some, but there's not, there's just, there's no there there. And even in the big markets, even in the Chicago's and the LA's and the New York's, uh, you know, the damn few, uh, uh, so I need to come in Garbo and, and in all our, things, the wonderful things we're saying about people helping people. Uh, we've got to bring Garbo into the mix because the, 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 if he has facilitated this and I, hopefully this is the beginning of more of this uh, with, with, with getting different points of view and different stories and different experiences. And the more experiences we can bring to this about things that have happened to us and for us to, to ask specific questions, we can talk in generalities forever, but we, we run into specific situations where something happens specifically uh, on a commission or just a customer. Because a commission, we're, we're not talking about big, doing big memorials all the time. We're talking about just doing art for people uh, that we don't know and they don't know us and how do we conduct our business and how do we make it happen? How do we get the word out to other people that we do commissions and then we'll do art to their liking instead of our liking and stuff. So uh, congrats to Garbo on the hope we don't leave her out of this, out of this whole conversation about, you know, how do we do this? Because she's doing, a, a, she's doing yeoman's work, putting something like this together. And, and I hope in a, all of our conversation, we don't leave the, the gallery system out of this. Not at all. I mean, she, look, she's my main gallery. I mean, this conversation wouldn't be happening if it wasn't from for Garbo. I mean, I've had plenty of people asking me, man, what's up with you in this gallery in Little Rock, Arkansas? And so when I tell them about the gallery and how prominent she is and what they do and the artists that they represent, they're like, they're shaking their head. They can't believe it, you know, because they think that this is just some little hole in the wall. Turn fine artist, little hole in the wall gallery that, you know, just rep represents, you know, just, I mean, I, I don't know what they think they represent, but now once I tell these people about how prominent and what they've done with the art, then they're all trying to say, hey, how, how do I get in? Yeah. How do I, how do I, you know, can I, can you put me in touch with, uh, with uh, Garbo? And I, and I do, I put them in touch, but it's like, I tell them, I said, it's not up to me for her to accept your work, but I'll put you in touch with them. And, you know, you, you should have jumped on the bandwagon a long time ago. 
because I have people saying right now, it's like, you know, I am a gallery artist. Um, us knowing each other has not happened through social media, uh, through any festivals or anything like that. It's happened because of my uh, understanding of the importance of um, black galleries. I mean, I'm saying black galleries because white galleries, uh, I've shown with a few, but very few of them, they just they don't want to touch my work, you know? So we have to go and we have to support our black galleries. It's mandatory that we support these galleries because not only are they just a gallery, what they are is, is history. Garbo doesn't just sell art. She sells history. You go in there and she's got books that you can't find anywhere inside of her gallery. I mean, so, and, and she's giving lectures. She's having art talks. She's having some of the greatest artists in the world come through her gallery. I met some incredible people just walking in the door of her gallery. I mean, that I don't meet and I never would meet anywhere else. So, yes, I, I think that's great for you to say that, Ed, that, you know, that we do have to give Garbo credit for being who she is and understanding the importance of uh, the gallery and how it is our tool of understanding who better understanding who we are as people because and through the arts because of what she provides. Yeah, well, thanks, guys. I'm gonna have to sign off, guys, because I've got another uh, little deal to get. But but anyway, thanks to all of you, and it was good meeting you, the ones that I haven't met before. Uh, and Garbo, thanks. I love you, babe. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. So time it is 4.35 and this was supposed to end at 3.30, but you know, <laughs> greatness, you can't, you can't put a time clock on it. But I want to say that I appreciate all four of these dynamic artists who've come together. They've come from different perspectives, their history, their journeys, but it all leads back to black excellence. And as a gallerist, all of you on the call, I, I challenge you to look in your home. If you don't have a piece of sculpture by these artists, it's time to pick up the phone and call me. And this is how you can reach me. But I do wanna say that I don't do this alone. My partner is here, Archie. Can you put the screen back up? Cause I do want him to say, at least say hello. Archie, can you unmute yourself? Do you see me? Do you, are you listening? Looks like he's looking away not paying attention, but at any rate, my daughter is here, Anna, who has put this together. We appreciate um, all the things that she does, technology, social media. This is a family affair and we appreciate your presence this afternoon. This has been a dynamic moment in history because today's these artists, they know of each other, but they've not formally ever introduced or talked to each other. So this is what a gallery does we make people network and collaborate and we are looking for a positive future for all of these artists that we're going to be here to support along with social media. We're all part of this whole picture of moving Black art to the future and excellence. So thank you so much. Anna, do you have anything to say? Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your patience. All questions that were asked in the chat will be addressed. Um, we just know that this is a long time to be on Zoom. So we appreciate those who have stayed the entire time. Um, this recording will be made available. Um, we will be uh, emailing everyone that registered for the event. So we encourage you to share, share, share. Um, join our mailing list to uh, hear about more um, events in the future. And thank you. I think my dad finally unmuted. Would you like to say anything, Dr. Hearn? Can you hear me? I Archie, can you hear us? I, I don't think he has this. But still, anyway, that so. is my partner. That is the person that actually is an impetus for Hearn Fine Art as a collector in college. He always knew the, he knew the value and that is why the gallery was started. So, you know, this is the guy who has helped make everything. So thanks again. And you all have a great evening and we will answer your questions. So good night, good afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>